Hello, and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer. On today's episode, we have Tony Caglianis, the Senior Vice President with CBRE. We'll be talking about hybrid working, return to office, commercial real estate, and the city of Chicago. It's a jam-packed conversation, so let's not waste another minute. Work Inspired starts right now. Thanks so much for being here. Really excited for this conversation. Great to meet you and glad we're doing this in person. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Super excited. So tell me your professional story. I know I know about you because I've been following you on LinkedIn and all your great posts did, you know, over the last couple of years. But for our listeners, appreciate that. Who's Tony? How'd you get to where you're at today? Who's Tony? Well, I think uh, if you asked 10 different friends, they may give you 10 different answers. <laughs> nice. um, Tony on the personal side, someone who's super outgoing, super fun, loves to stay active, work out run along with his dog, um, go to concerts, go to new restaurants with his girlfriend. On the professional side, someone who's hyper-competitive. Mm. And obviously that translates really well into my profession and tenant representation. Um, but prior to that, went to the University of Iowa. I know you did go too. Hawks, yeah. Go Hawks. I was a marketing major, so mm -hmm. not a CMO, but know a thing or two <laughs> about marketing, especially as it relates to real estate. Um, out of school, wanted to be in sales, got a job at the corporate executive board, which I think has one of the best uh, sales training programs for all you know, recently out of college individuals. Mm. Um, learned a lot about rejection, mm -hmm. learned a lot about objection handling, uh, and learned a lot about how to drive business mm. and climbed my way to the top of that organization, uh, at least from a junior level standpoint, found a ceiling, um, wanted to find some sales job that was more in person and client facing mm -hmm. instead of behind a phone or a computer. Had some friends in real estate, got my license, brokered my way through most of the shops, CBRE, Cushman, JLL, Colliers, you name it, and then met my two business partners now, Brad Surratt and Paul Ramon. Mm. When I met them, they were leading the charge in the tech ecosystem in Chicago. Brad was doing the Salesforce Tower deal that's now fully built and occupied. Mm -hmm. Paul was working on the Uber Freight headquarters, heard their story and basically said, if I'm going to do this, I'm only going to work for you use my cold calling skills, cold called them again for about 12 to 14 more months mm -hmm. and berated them really until they finally gave me a job. And, you know, now we're here in 2024. I'm an equity partner with them and a senior vice president. And really what I do all day is focus on tenant representation. So mm. helping companies think through what their real estate strategy is. And now more than ever, you know, that's changing daily. So definitely. And we'll, we'll dive into that. So we've had on the show, you know, we've done over 100 episodes now. We featured a leader from CBRE in the Florida market, and he was in the industrial space, and that was during the pandemic. Yep. Recently, we had Spencer Levy on, and yep. obviously, he's got a global, national global perspective on the business. But you're the first from the Chicago market that we've had on the show. Talk about the culture at CBRE here. I know you you just talked about your your individual team. Yep. Is it is it siloed like that? Are you guys like your own business unit? Or do you tap into the large? I mean, because CBRE is a huge company with a ton of resources. Yeah, that's a great question. So our team considers ourselves a startup mm. with within the umbrella of a Fortune 150 company. Mm. So, you know, I, I mentioned I have equity partners. I have three equity partners. 50% of our mm. business is focused downtown Chicago. Okay. That's where I spend a majority of my, of my time. And then the other half of our business is spent national and global. Mm. So companies that are Fortune 100, Fortune 10 even, we represent out of Chicago globally. So we've done deals in every single continent. Oh, wow. Our team on average, somewhere between 150 to 200 transactions per year wow. um, all over the world. So uh, we're a startup in the fact that we can kind of create how we operate and CB gives us a lot of autonomy and makes us feel really entrepreneurial. But we get all those resources because if we were just a local brokerage firm, we wouldn't be able to do those large global transactions mm. in different markets. So mm. super happy about being at CBRE in Chicago, but also being able to do you know deals anywhere throughout the world. Cool. So I mentioned your post on on LinkedIn, and I know I know you're a champion for return to office. Yeah. Clearly, I mean, like with us, it's a little self serving, right? Right. We'll, it will do business more business if people come back to the office, but. I mean, I did some soul searching during the pandemic, and I've mentioned this on the show before. It is important to be together. Like, I firmly believe it. I'm not just saying we should be back in the office because I wanted some more workspaces. Yep. I think humans need to be together to do their best work, whether they're competing in sports or whether they're, you know, in a, in a military function or they're in, in, a, in a corporate office. That's my belief. And it seems like you share that belief based off of what you've been posting. So from your perspective, I'm interested since I've got you across the table. Yeah. Why do you think the return to office movement is important and why do you think it's necessary for at least part of the work that we do to be done 
in person? Well, first off, as you kind of mentioned, if I wasn't a return to office or return to work champion, I probably wouldn't do, be doing my job right. very well. Right, right. Uh, you know, that being said, I'll just talk about the way that I learned in my career, mm -hmm. um, it was all in person and the ability to sit across the room from an expert in sales every single day really helped mold how I was able to become someone that I am now as mm -hmm. it relates to my job. And being able to have those quick five, 10 minute conversations popping in and out and having that connectivity instead of having to call someone, set up a Zoom, wait for 30 minutes, hour, two hours, three hours, have that call hang up, forget you had a question just mm -hmm. to have to reschedule all over again. There's a difference there. And then also the loyalty piece. Yeah. Obviously, like it was really, really good for me to learn from uh, Jen Allen, who is a corporate executive board and obviously Brad at CVRE. But, you know, would they really have been as loyal to me throughout those times when I was learning and falling and help, helping me pick up the pieces mm -hmm. if I was just someone sitting behind a computer screen? Mm -hmm. So I think that part is really, really important as it relates to return to office. And then from a macro level in the city of Chicago, capitalism is the bloodline of any city. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have people filling up the offices, the rest of the economy starts to crumble a little bit. And candidly, we saw that in COVID. Mm -hmm. A lot of retail start to dis started to dissipate. Restaurants were going away. As employees have started to come back, everyone says, well, wait a minute, Chicago all of a sudden is starting to feel a little bit better, starts to feel a little bit more normal. And the reality is obviously, again, bias, but when people are in office, it does feel normal because it was normal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's my kind of high level overview of why I think that, you know, office is important and super excited about the trends we're seeing in Chicago today. Yeah. I mean, if you drive down the expressway or you get on the train, it's packed. So, and I just saw some new numbers and they're increasing. So that's good news. Yeah. I think it was a matter of time before people realized it, but we still do here. I mean, I talked to one guy on the platform while I was waiting for the train today and he goes, ah, I come down downtown once or twice a week, but if I didn't have to. So like we right. still hear pushback, you know, and, and when you talk to business leaders, What's the, the conversation like? I mean, are you still focused mostly on tech? Um, because of COVID, I had to, you know, think about other avenues sure. of driving revenue. So I focus on all sectors and I did really focus on all sectors previously. Fast growth is kind of what okay. my focus was. Okay. Obviously back before COVID, fast growth in office meant tech. They yeah. raised a round of funding yeah. and all of a sudden they needed more and more office space. Mm -hmm. But I also did Aspen Dental's headquarter relocation mm -hmm. and that was fast growth too. They mm -hmm. went from 50,000 square feet to 200,000 square feet in the matter of two years. Sure. So had all different various outlooks as it relates to um, how executives think about office space. Mm -hmm. I think it totally varies sector by sector mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tech is the biggest lagger of return to office. They have the most subway space on the market as it relates to that as well. Um, so they are very much more remote focused. That being said, we're active right now with eight different companies who went remote and are now thinking about how they get people back together mm -hmm. again in the tech sector specifically. Mm -hmm. And then if we talk about, you know, mentor mentee relationships, right? Mm -hmm. My relationship with Brad, um, law firms are really one of the biggest drivers in the market right mm -hmm. now today, because all those law firms want those associates to learn from their partners, not only to become partners at that firm, but to stay partners on at that firm and not just go to the next law firm that let them sit behind mm -hmm. a computer desk. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Trading firms, you mm -hmm. know, high IT, high security needs. The traders were almost in office throughout COVID. <laughs> they never left. It never changed. Right. And so they were the ones that were doing a ton of transactions and still are, um, you know, from 2020 through 2024. So again, every executive will tell you different. I, you know, I'm not an HR leader, but I do think that having leadership from the top down and having a concise message and having all those leaders also, you know, embody what the messages of the business is really important. And it's interesting, you know, you talk about the legal space. We are doing a bunch in the legal space as well. You brought up the competitive nature of business and capitalism. And it seems that, that those are the people that are in. Why do we come to work? Well, to collaborate because we can focus at home. Right. But it seems to me that the trend is more, you know, the competitive cultures are the ones that are in because they want to be as high performing as possible. Yeah. Not saying that the, com the collaborative cultures aren't, but it's interesting to see the sectors that are more predominantly in person. I mean, you know my world just as well as I do. It's very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. And I'm the first one to tell you, even though that I love what I do, if I'm sitting at home and my dog is there mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful day or my TV and couch look pretty appealing, <laughs> maybe I'm not going to work that extra 30 minutes or an hour that could separate me from my competition. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm sitting at 321 North Clark at the top floor at CBRE's office and I'm looking around and I'm sitting next to some of the most cutthroat individuals in the city of Chicago who not only want our competitors lunch, they probably want my lunch too. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you know, I'm working just a little bit harder, making that extra call, pushing out that extra email to try and ensure that our team is 
you know, still on top. That focus is what you're getting when you're going into that, into that office. You're, you, you don't have those distractions. Now you right. might do your headstone work at home. And I think that's one of the things that came out of the pandemic that we all are going to benefit from is that hybrid is here to stay because we now have more flexibility and we can work in more places. I mean, the amount of video calls that were done before the pandemic baffled me. And then of course, like one month later, we're all on them, you know, and now everybody does a video call. Yep. Not to say that I would rather do this than, I mean, this is why we're here in person and not in Zoom. But what are you seeing as the tenants that you're representing, their hybrid strategies? Are you seeing some that work better than others? Are you seeing trends? Yep. From your perspective, how do you effectively navigate this new hybrid world? Yeah, well, the ones that haven't worked are the ones where companies just rolled out a couple days and mm. didn't give out any more information. Mm -hmm. So come in two days a week, Whatever doesn't matter what two days a week. Yeah. The reality is one salesperson could come in and be connected to no other salespeople or mm -hmm. an operations person could come in and not make that meeting with the CFO who's not going to be in that day. So mm -hmm. I think clarity, again, from the top down on what days you're coming in, why you're coming in, consistency, again, not only telling you what to do, but doing it mm -hmm. and, and not just having the low uh, employees, but the middle employees and the upper management all buy in. Mm. And then, um, you know, from a culture standpoint, make sure that there's things outside of just heads down work mm -hmm. to come in for. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have to have those, those cross pollination meetings between operations of finance and sales and marketing. But Hey, at the end of the day, if you're coming in, we're all going to go to the baseball game mm -hmm. or we're all going to go to the happy hour downstairs, or we just signed a lease in one of the coolest amenity buildings in Chicago. We're going to go play, you know, pickleball on the rooftop. Yeah. So have <laughs> reasons to come in other than work. Because again, if you build that culture and you build that relationship and that friendship with your employee, you're going to want to come in because mm -hmm. it is more fun than maybe sitting in your 800 square foot apartment by yourself. Yeah. And I think that's where we're landing is that you can create the coolest place in the world to come to the pickleball, you know, the, the amazing amenities, the furniture, that's, that's the carrot. The benefit of coming in is what you alluded to earlier. That's the trust. That's the loyalty, the relationships, the mentorship. So use these other tactics to get those people in, but realize that the benefit is unless people are in together and it's an intentional effort, those right. desired outcomes aren't going to be achieved, right? Without the people, the place is really not relevant, right? Yep. So we had Spencer on, as I mentioned earlier, and he's kind of known for his economic forecasting. And we, I asked, I mean, this was earlier in the year. And I said, what, what does commercial real estate look like in 2024? Maybe even into 2025, he gave his perspective. But you being a guy working with all these different companies, half here in Chicago, half around the country. Yep. What's your perspective? Because it seems like every broker I ask has a bit of a different answer. Let's focus on Chicago. Okay. What's your perspective for the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, uh, we're seeing a ton of velocity. I mm -hmm. mentioned that there's mm -hmm. eight tech companies that are dipping their toes back in the market that were remote. So that's mm -hmm. something that I haven't seen as mm -hmm. a tech leader in Chicago over the past 12, 24. So I think that is the beginning tips of what is to come, okay. uh, especially if those companies see value in the next 12, 24 months once they sign those leases. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. I'm sure you've heard the term flight to quality. Yep. A lot of tenants, when they're coming to the market, how do they choose their office? Well, they want to make the experience of working from home, from the office better than the experience right. of working from home. They do that with amazing, incredible space. Mm -hmm. So all the you know trophy and class A assets on Wacker Drive and Fulton Market are getting close to fully leased up. Mm -hmm. So you're asking my prediction, what happens after that? I think after flight to quality, we're going to have a flight to convenience mm -hmm. where maybe you're not going to be in the trophy asset, but you're going to be next to it because most of the trophy assets are next to all the transportation mm -hmm. routes. And you'll get the delta in the rent in comparison to the top of the market rents in Chicago, which we haven't seen really before COVID in 60, 70, $80 a foot, mm -hmm. but you're moving into the more convenient building that's nearby those transportation hubs at $40 a foot, or maybe mm -hmm. you're finding an incredible sublease in a trophy asset at $38 a foot or something along those lines. The other prediction that I keep I keep saying is an accordion marketplace. Mm. I think that during COVID, we started to have a lot of companies venture out into churchary markets. Mm -hmm. So Fulton, and they kept having companies expand further and further west. Mm. Or maybe we were thinking about going into Lincoln Park. As the world starts to come back, as people start to take the trains that you're saying are mm. full or the L's that you're saying are full, are full, maybe tenants and companies start thinking about coming back into the city, mm -hmm. you, you know, accordion out, accordion mm -hmm. in, and taking advantage of some of the spatial issues that the loop is having, for mm -hmm. example. 
Mm. I know for a fact that the Board of Trade is go, has 60,000 square feet of deals at least right now. Mm. If you were to ask me how many deals the Board of Trade has in 2022, I would tell you zero. Mm. So we're starting to see that already happen. And um, that excites me because yeah. the volatility as a broker is really good because it has companies coming to us and asking questions. Hmm. What's your perspective on some of these buildings that are going back to the bank? You know, is there going to be as much reconfiguration as some people are speculating? Yeah, uh, I think it's opportunity, mm -hmm. one. Um, the reality is because of hybrid work, there we probably don't need as much office space in most cities mm. as there were, but there clearly still is a need. Mm. Uh, the ability to convert commercial buildings to residential buildings has a ton of challenges. Yep. You know, plumbing for one, mm -hmm. but just the infrastructure in general for two, there's a lot of costs associated with it. So how to underwrite how to do that successfully, I think mm -hmm. is very challenging. Um, but if we can get some of those buildings reconverted and we can make the loop, for example, maybe entertainment district mm -hmm. or have some reason to drive people to that area, especially with maybe Google coming to the Thompson Center. Um, you know, I think those distressed assets all just create different levels of opportunity for people. And I think we'll start to see not only international buyers come back to the city, but um, institutional local people start to buy distressed assets on 30, 40 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. And because of that flight to convenience, see that as a way to take advantage of a distressed market. Mm. Good perspective. You're a Midwest guy. You made your business here in Chicago. Why do you like Chicago? Yes, I love Chicago. I always joke with my friends to throw my body in the river when I'm gone. <laughs> I think it'll decompose the green pretty easily. River. Yeah, yeah, the Green River, right? <laughs> What's not to like about Chicago? I'm very, very bullish, very, very biased, but I think in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years, Chicago is going to be one of the best cities in the world if mm -hmm. it isn't already. Um, let's talk about access to talent first. Mm -hmm. So we have the University of Chicago right here. We have UIC. We have all the Big Ten schools that flood into Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you know this, but Chicago actually had the second highest amount of recent graduate job applications mm -hmm. last year. Really? So we're talking about a lot of people thinking about our city already. Mm -hmm. um, so quality labor coming in and then cheaper labor than the coast. The cost of an engineer in Chicago compared to New York or San Francisco is almost half. And oh. You're still getting that great talent. Mm -hmm. And then obviously from a real estate perspective, San Francisco rents, New York rents, and now Miami rents are all much, much higher. Mm -hmm. And there's different opportunities in Chicago, both from a commercial landscape and a residential la landscape. So mm. the same talent you're getting for cheaper is also getting their rent for cheaper. Mm. Um, we have an you know, you know, international airport that you know can get people to and from anywhere in the world fairly quickly. I sell with that when I'm talking about national portfolio clients because mm. I can fly to any city you know in two and a half hours or less. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, Chicago has had the most headquarter relocations um, in America, I think for the past 11 years. Really? And it always talks about the doom and gloom of the yeah. city, but the reality is people think about Chicago for the exact same reasons that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then thinking more long term and maybe a little cynical, but uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about the coasts, Chicago is going to be pretty protected in the event of rising sea levels and mm -hmm. natural disasters and then a large natural body of water. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And we now have 70 degree days during the winter. So yeah. those terrible winters are. Today was Must really do. cold. I didn't bring a jacket, but two weeks ago when it was 70 degrees, you know, I kept joking that uh, Chicago is the Miami of Canada. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I've seen that you're also involved in some startups and you're, you know, a seed partner. You, you're like, you're still in that tech world, that startup world yeah. in some capacity. And as a marketing guy, you know, and working with these fast growth, high, you know, quickly scaling businesses. What are some of the innovations that you're excited about? Coming out of COVID, I mean, everyone talked about COVID and how do you deal with COVID and, and then all that change, right? And then it was, how do you get people back to the office or how do you navigate the new way of working? Seems like now on this show, the trend has been disruptive technology, whether it's AI, what's coming in the next two years that's going to basically change the way we all live and work and do anything. From your perspective, what are you what are you looking at? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my perspective as it relates to, to, to real estate. So more often than not, when tech signed big leases mm -hmm. and kind of Apple and Facebook were the bigger drivers of this, it was just a giant open sea of desks. Mm -hmm. Then when COVID hit, to your point, people were working from home and had a lot of heads down work. Mm -hmm. So to bring people back into that sea of chaos wasn't very conducive to the way their employees were thinking about how they get good work done. Mm. So uh, I'll just give you a really good example. Uh, Fetch Rewards, we just signed a lease for them at 609 West Randolph about 18 months ago. Okay. Pre-COVID, they would have been a sea of desks. They would have been 50,000 square feet with mm. the same amount of employees they have. Mm. But during COVID, they had a great chief people officer they hired named Rachel who put in great strategies and they wanted to implement 
their hybrid connectivity, but also still have that really important in-person culture. Sure. And so they decided to sign a 22,000 square foot lease, so about half the space. But what they did that was interesting was they chose a building with small floor plates. So they're stacked across three floors and, you know, seven and a half thousand square feet per floor. So when those slower days come, they can all go to one floor yep. and concentrate. It still feels like the hustle and bustle mm. without having to walk into 22,000 square feet and have five people and be like, why am I actually it's smart? Here? And mm -hmm. the other part that they did as it relates to how they built out the space, again, instead of a sea of desks, they had desks on their top floor, desks on their bottom floor, and the middle was a hub for connectivity mm. where the whole place almost kind of looks like a WeWork mm. where there's different places you can go and have you know, large group meetings. They have a garage door that opens and closes to make the conference rooms look larger and smaller. Um, so I thought that was super innovative mm -hmm. and, and one way that I think people are changing the way they think about office space because oftentimes when you were a large company previously, you didn't want to be stacked on multiple floors. Right. And then another a global fintech company that I can't name uh, but planted their flag for their sales hub in Chicago – they probably built the most innovative space that I've seen in quite some time. Mm. I see there's, you have a lot of greenery in this room mm. right now that we're in. They basically put a giant forest in the middle of their office space. Yeah. And it was a place for people to go and take, you know, meeting walks. Cause a lot of times in COVID you're on your zoom, you're on your headphones, you're able to walk during your meetings. So they actually said, Hey, we're going to allow that to happen within the workspace and then go back to your desk. We were just like an hour ago talking about this because we were joking kind of, but we've got 150,000 square feet in an industrial building in Roselle. Yep. But it, uh, uh, probably 30,000 square feet is, is showroom office. And it's high ceilings, 35 foot ceilings. We're like, we should put a forest in here. And right now at like Costco, you can buy a $500 tree. It's, I mean, it's fake, but like it would be hard to maintain a live forest. I don't know if that's what they did, but yeah. that's what people are looking for, right? And then the one thing I'll mention from a technology standpoint that I actually just experienced for the first time with one of my clients as we were talking about their next office project, you talked about AI. Hmm. We were in person, but they had a recording going on in, in the conference room. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I got an AI transcript that was bullet pointed on what our conversations were, you know, what X person was doing that weekend, what their kids' names are, mm -hmm. what the main core competencies and or topics were about the conversation, all downloaded in a digestible format for me. And I was like, hmm, that's cool. Sounds like I don't have to take notes anymore for yeah. the rest of my life, which is pretty sweet. Within the 30 minutes before you got here, I got a request. I think Zoom just in, you know introduced something like that where it's, it's transcript. So yeah, I mean, I think that that's where technology is really exciting is it's going to free us up to do the in-person relationship building and this trust building more genuinely you know yeah i mean again obviously biased but some of the remote jobs could go away yeah and some of the jobs that are more focused with in-person communication connectivity may be the ones that the high paying employees want to have exactly and while we sit here having this great conversation there could be an ai checking our emails and letting us know what we missed and what we don't I, need to worry I about so. right yeah me too <laughs> You're a young guy and have had a lot of success. Obviously, a lot of that's due to your driven personality and your competitive nature. But I ask every guest if there's a resource that they could recommend that has been valuable to them. You mentioned one group already. But is there a book, a podcast, a networking group that you found valuable that you could recommend to others? Yeah, so I'll talk about networking really quickly, and this is for the tech community in Chicago. I'm a co-founder of Shy Tech IRL. Okay. Uh, basically, me... Two venture capitalists and an entrepreneur came together during COVID when there was no events and started throwing events mm. because we thought that a lot of people were missing the connectivity. Mm. The tech community in Chicago is one that's very, very close knit. Mm. And we wanted to make sure that we still encaptured the new coming people out of college because a lot of, a lot of times these entrepreneurs leave the city. Mm -hmm. We want them to build in Chicago. Mm. So Shy Tech RL, we're going to have a couple of events this year. We're super excited about that. And then as it relates to things that I listen to, um, obviously, again, more on the tech side, the All In podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a great you know four-person podcast that talks about current events and technology and just keeps me up to date and something that I listen to, whether I'm doing my laundry or on the Stairmaster. So I think that's the <laughs> other one that I'd recommend. What's something you're looking forward to in the next 12 months, personally or professionally? Professionally, we talked about it. I'm excited to see the continued velocity mm -hmm. downtown in the office market. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to see what happens after some of these you know, trophy towers get fully leased. I want to see what happens to some of the development sites if interest rates go down. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll start seeing some new developments go up. And then professionally, a uh, ton of travel. Um, I'm in the period of my life where a lot of my friends are getting married. Mm -hmm. So bachelor parties, I'm going to Dublin for a wedding mm -hmm. coming up soon. So Same. a lot of travel with my girlfriend and just want to spend more time with my family. So get it done before you ever have kids someday. Cause <laughs> I just returned from a Florida trip with my three kids and that is 
I need a vacation from that vacation. That's not a vacation. <laughs> that's a relocation. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. <laughs> All right. Final question. Clearly, you're not retiring tomorrow. But if you were, what's some advice you'd leave behind for future leaders? I would tell you to just be persistent. Mm. Uh, I was actually talking to a junior broker of mine, and I just told him today that it takes seven no's to finally get to that yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people think that, that, you know, they'll get their graduate degree or get their MBA and they'll be an overnight success. The reality is life comes at you pretty fast mm. and not to give up. Be mm. persistent, figure out different ways to find and bring value to the people around you. And over time, if you do that enough, you know, um, you'll find success. Great advice. And Tony, thank you so much for being here. It's been an awesome conversation. Learned a lot. Excited to keep following you and everything you're doing with your career. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.